So let's just jump into it. Uh, trademarks 101. So we'll start out, and some of this, you heard a little bit about trademarks in uh, next door. Um, but so we'll, like I said, this will be a high level discussion, but if you want to drill down on anything in particular at any time, just let me know. So fundamental question, what is a trademark? Well, it can be any of these things. It can be a word. It can be a word, and I, what I didn't put on there, it can be a word in particular stylization or a particular typeface, particular color, or it can just be the word. Uh, it can be a design or a, what everybody usually calls a logo. It could be a phrase like I'm loving it and all the other phrases you, you hear on, on, uh, on TV in connection with various products and services. Uh, colors. Uh, UPS uh, has uh, trademark protection over brown for the services they provide. Uh, T-Mobile has protection of magenta for the kinds of services they provide and I had to deal with that actually in uh, representing a client who ran afoul of that particular color. Uh, so, uh, and then non-traditional marks, which was touched on a bit, sound, sense, product packaging sort of falls into that. I put non-traditional in quotes just because I, I feel like that's less and less appropriate a term for these things because sounds in particular are becoming more common as, I think, as, as trademarks. But for the moment, they're considered non-traditional. So when you think of sounds, you hear them all the time and you probably don't, they probably don't register anymore, but the the little, you know, uh, the the Intel sound is a classic one. The when you're at the movie theater, the the THX blast that comes at you, that's that's one as well. Um, sense, I can't think of some good example. I know that, that like thread, there's one in particular where there's a thread that has a particular sense. So anything like that can function as a trademark. Uh, and there, the strength of those marks depends on where they fall on this spectrum. And pardon me, I'm not an expert at PowerPoint or things like that. So this is the extent of my design skills, all right? The dashes, the dash button on the keyboard. Um, so when you're thinking about, if you're, and I don't know if any of you are you know, business owners, if you have products and services that you sell, if you've dealt with this before, but when you're thinking about trademarks, what you're thinking about is, I mean, a trademark is fundamentally, it tells people that you are the source of the particular product or service. And you want people to remember that. And you want it to be enforceable. And so you want a trademark that is str as strong as it can be. There's some tension with the, between the strength of the mark and, and, and the mark that you select, which I'll, I'll talk about. But when you're thinking about it, sort of think about this spectrum of, of strength. And so on the forest end, the weak end, obviously generic names really don't function as trademarks. It's just a generic name for a product some of the ones I've mentioned here were at one point trademarks. Aspirin, Escalator, Thermos were brands. They have since fallen out of, of that spectrum. They're now just generic terms for things. We call a thermos a thermos. We call an escalator an escalator. There's no, there's no other word for that thing. So those are generic. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, so, uh, and you just can't use them as trademarks because they're not going to tell someone that they're the source of a product. It's just going to tell them what the product is or the service. Uh, descriptive marks are a little better, but the, they, so the definition is that they merely describe some feature or function of the product or service. So if you have a restaurant called Chicken and Waffles and you sell chicken and waffles, well, it, you're just describing what it is you sell. And you can't, the, the idea behind the, the, in a, the, the weakness of that is if we allowed you to be the exclusive user of chicken and waffles for restaurants, then you would prevent someone else from saying, from calling their restaurant chicken and waffles or something like that. And people need to be able to describe what it is they do or what the product is. So there's this, this is where I think there's some tension when you're thinking about trademarks because a lot of people say to themselves, well, I don't want to come up with some crazy name for my product. I want people to know what the heck the product is when they go into the store or when, they, when they're going to my restaurant, it's helpful if they know something about what I'm, what I'm giving them. And so the tendency is to say, well, I want something that's a little bit descriptive, right? Um, but the problem is that if you fall into that category, your ability to, to protect that mark down the line is, it becomes more difficult. Now, it may, a descriptive mark may gain strength over time. So if you drill it into the customer's head that chicken and waffles is your trademark and not just what you sell, over time, that mark may gain more strength and be more enforceable. 
So it's not a it's it's not a dead end mark. I mean, they can still function very well as marks, but the, it's really ab about how how consistent your use is and how long your use is and how much you really drill it into people's minds. Uh, next on the spectrum is a suggestive mark. This is where I would say most trademarks that we deal with fall into this category. They don't describe exactly what the product or service might be, but they sort of hint at it. And when the consumer sees the, the trademark, they have to sort of make a, a little bit of a mental leap to connect the mark with the product. Chicken of the sea is a good example. I mean, it's not literally chicken, but it, this idea that tuna is the chicken of the sea, people make that connection. And so it's, it's stronger because it doesn't describe what the product is. There is some, there's some uh, um, um, thought that people need to put into it. And over time, again, that makes it easier for it to sink into people's heads that it's a trademark and not just a term for the product. An arbitrary uh, mark is, is a real dictionary term that has absolutely no connection to the product or the service. So for tuna, like bumblebee, it's not, there's no bumblebees in the tuna, it's just the name of it. Uh, Apple, for computers, obviously Apple doesn't have any particular meaning with respect to computers. Uber, um, I don't think has any connection to car service, as far as I know, I'm, I'm sort of guessing, I, I, but uh, it is a real word. Um, those are great if you, if, you're, if you can come up with something like that. The problem is, as I said before, when someone first encounters the trademark, they don't know any. They don't know what it is. They, I mean, Bumblebee. Okay. Well, what is it? What are you selling me? So that's the, a bit of that tension about the difference between a descriptive and and maybe an arbitrary mark. And then a fanciful word is just a, a made-up word, completely made up. You've, you, it doesn't exist in a dictionary. Kodak is a classic one for that. I'm sure there's there's a million of those now with with these sort of internet uh, services that come up with cr weird names for things. Um, and again. A lot of times people will say, I don't want to come up with a weird name. If those names sound stupid, they don't have vowels in them or whatever. I want something a little bit more uh, understandable to people, and so maybe you go down that spectrum a little bit. So when we're talking about weak, weakness and strength, it's in sort of two, two ways. Again, it's about the meaning to the customer and the, it's, it's stickiness, right? It's, it's ability for the, to the customer to... to uh, to, to remember that mark and what it means, and also your ability to enforce it down the line. If someone else comes along and has some, is using something similar for, for a similar product, a competing product or service, you want to be able to say, well, we should be the ones that have the exclusive right to use this mark for this, in this particular product. Uh, the, the further down towards the weak end of the spectrum you get, the harder that argument is to make. Zoom. Um, just really quick, a trademark versus a trade name. This comes up a lot, um, and I just want to just touch on this distinction, where there is a distinction. So a trade name is the name that's used to identify your business, typically for non-marketing purposes. So it's not, it, it can be your trademark, but oftentimes it's not your trademark. It's just the name you use when you're signing a contract or whatever it may be. So oftentimes it's a DBA, right? So if you have your corporate name and then your DBA, your DBA may also function as your trademark. Maybe you're out there selling super great computers, right? Super great brand computers. Uh, but maybe you don't. Maybe super great is just your trade name and you have some other brand that you use for the products and services that you sell. So I just want to touch on that because that question does come up uh, from time to time. If you go uh, on the UNH corporate website, the, the Secretary of State website, there's a database of trade names and, and all this stuff. And so if you go and search there, you'll see they don't have a list of trademarks. A lot of, a lot of, um, of uh, corporate, uh, state corporation websites, you can search by business name or by trademark or whatever it may be. New Hampshire, for whatever reason, has had the same website for decades and you just plug in a name and it just spits out everything, whether it's a trade name or whatever it may be. So um, I just find it useful to have that brief distinction there. Yeah. Oh, sure. Well, that's a good question. Um, so, <clears throat> an acronym, if it's a, it depends on what the acronym is. If it's a made up acronym, right? If it's something that you, um, you've come up with the underlying long form words and then you create the acronym out of that, it can function as a perfectly good, strong trademark, right? Um, because it's not necessarily seen as descriptive unless it's a common acronym 
in the industry, right? So, and I can't think of a good one, but um, uh, we have certainly have plenty of people who use acronyms. Now, it may be that nobody knows it's an acronym, right? Um, so if you if you've picked just three random letters, let's say, uh, or if you pick three letters as an acronym, the customer may not know that it's actually functioning as an acronym. What's that? Oh yeah, so GE, something like that. Yeah. Right. So GE, right? Well, that's a good a good example. I mean, obviously, it's short for General Electric. So um, that can function just perfectly fine as its own mark. But it, it, I don't know if you had an example in mind of what you were thinking about. Well, uh, Eric Schwartz has a program. Uh, we filed a trademark application on for HUT, H-U-T-T. Oh, okay. And so it's an acronym, sort of, for helmetless um, tackling training. Okay. I mean, if that's not a, an industry term, because what's going to happen is if you file the application, the examining attorney is going to, first they're going to look at their database to see if anybody's used HUTT or something close to that for similar products, right? But they're also going to go and say, well, is this a common acronym, a common term that's used to describe these sorts of products? And if they find that other people call, use HUT, HUTT in this field, then they're going to say, well, it's just a common industry term. Like, I think there was one that we dealt with, um, was it SIP? It's some sort of security protocol, and uh, or SEP. I can't remember what it was, and that was the problem we ran into: is that the, the the trademark office did a search and found that everybody refers to it as this, even if you might have added a word to it here and there, you know, at the beginning or the end. That particular piece of it was just common industry term. And again, the idea is you can't pull a common uh, something that's commonly used to refer to the product out of the out of the marketplace. Other people need to be able to talk about what they're selling. So it sounds to me like that's probably not going to be an issue with that particular acronym. Okay, yeah. Matt, Matt, can I uh, ask yeah. one more question? Yeah. Uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, they're, they're very creative. Yeah. Uh, so let's say, for example, two, two, two cases. Where would it fit in? Claritin. Where does it fit in? Where does it fit into your scheme? Uh, I would, I would assume that, and I don't know, I'm thinking that Claritin is a made-up words. I mean, usually these pharmaceuticals, they, they pay people thousands of dollars to make up words. Yeah. So I would guess that it falls into that, in, closer to the fanciful end of things, I'm assuming. I, it may be. I, I, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, it... Because uh, it's, it's, it's allergy relief. Yeah. And then think of Aleve. Aleve, which is... Right, which alleviates uh, pain. Right. Yeah. So it's possible that that could be seen that way. I, I, I just don't know. I mean, that these are, but they're but good. It's interesting. This, they, they almost like to uh, something that's somewhere between suggested and yeah. and the pharmaceutical. Well, again, and the idea is you want, uh, there's some people don't want to have this completely random word. They want to have some hint as to what's what's being the marketing, some quality of the market, product. Marketers pound it into, the, right. into our mind. Exactly. You had a question or comment? Going back to HUT. Yeah. Um, because it's for football in particular. Yeah. That's what quarterbacks said. Oh, right, sure. It was intentional because it's a suggestion, but then I wonder if it certainly is a common term, but I'm not sure we would say that's industry unless yeah. you're about the for profit portions of the industry, which I guess would be NCAA yeah. and NFL in some respects. But um, I'll, I'll yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, the, the fact that a, that a quarterback says HUT. I mean, that alone is not a problem. It's only, it's only an issue if someone is using, if HUT has to be used in the field that you're talking about. Like, for, I don't know what the products are or the services are, but whatever it may be, um, then it would be an issue. I mean, you can, um, so it's not just that it's just sort of generally uh, used in that industry, um, in that context. I think it wouldn't be an issue, I, I think. Um, without commenting on your particular situation, <laughs> I'll leave that to Tim. <laughs> um, so, as was touched on across the way, the primary goal, ostensibly, the primary goal of a trademark is to is is for consumer protection purposes. It's to tell people who is the source of this product, for better or for worse. Right? If you have a bad experience or a good experience, you'll know who to go to or who to, who who is responsible for that. So I just use baseball gloves as an example. I don't know why. But um, if I'm going into a store and there's a row of baseball gloves, well, I, the only way I can distinguish one from the other, other than maybe there's a, some, something about the design of them, is the brand, right? Um, so it tells me who produced this product. 
related to that is then after I've had some experience with the product, I then associate that experience with the brand. So again, for good or for ill, if I had a great experience, I Rawlings makes some great baseball gloves. Well, that's that's this association I've now made with the brand, and that's how a brand builds value, right? Is people know to go to that brand, even if there are competing products on the shelf. I mean, there's tons of people who make baseball gloves, but brand people go back to brands because they have some value to them. They have this association, um, which is commonly called goodwill. Um, and so that's really, fundamentally, that's what a trademark is designed to do. So again, when you're thinking about trademarks, um, you're thinking about, well, how do I distinguish my product or service from the others who may be doing, maybe you've got a unique product or service, right? You're the only one making it. Well, that's, if so, that's great. But most of the time, you're not. Most of the time, you're in a crowded market and you need to distinguish yourself. And this is how that's done. Uh, and then again, over time, hopefully, c consumers come back to you even though there are competing products because they have a, a good association in their mind with, with your brand. All right, how do I get a trademark? This is a common question, and I put get a trademark in quotes because that's not really how it works. Um, so a lot of times people ask, how do I get a trademark? They're thinking, how do I register? A how do I get a trademark registration? And we need to divide the world into two halves. There's the, the world of trademark registration and then the world of trademark use. And in the US, use is paramount, right? You can get a registration, but use is what matters. And that's why I said it three times in that first bullet point. Uh, in the US, trademark rights are gained through use of the trademark, use in commerce, okay? Um, a, a, a trademark doesn't, isn't a trademark until, in, in a vacuum. It's just a word or a phrase or whatever it's in a vacuum. It is only a trademark when it's used in connection with products or services in whatever way, as long as, it's, if, as long as it is indicating source, then it becomes, starts to gain trademark rights. And that happens through use. You can't get a registration without use, okay? Um, so your goal as brand owners is to start using your, your trademark as, as soon as you can, really, whenever the product or the service is ready, and to use it continuously, consistently, and consistently both in the way it's presented, and I'll talk about that, I think, at the end, and also with the, the products or services that you, that you would be selling. Um, as I, is that commercial use only? Yeah, and I'm gonna get, I'll get to that, actually. I will talk about what, why I have in commerce in quotes there. We'll talk about that. So you can't get a, a trademark registration without use in the US. It's different in other countries. In other countries, registration is what matters and use is not required to get a registration. US is different in that respect. Um, and we'll talk at the, well, I'll, I'll get into a little bit about the registration process and some of the options there when you don't have use yet, but it's just important to understand that. That your first goal should not, I mean, it, registration is, obviously it's recommended, but when you're getting started, on your list of things to do, uh, getting a, a re trademark registration should be on that list, but it shouldn't be the first thing you do. The first thing you want to think about is, you know, what's my product and service? When, how am I going to use it? What's my, what are my plans? How do I get to that first sale? Now, registration may fit in there before that first sale, or at least application might, um, but don't think, I don't have anything without a registration. You can have it all without a registration. Um, in fact, there are plenty of marks that you see all the time that, that may not be registered. And in particular, it usually is the case with things like slogans because they change. Slogans tend to change you know, with every few years. McDonald's, they've stuck with I'm loving it for a while, but it'll change eventually. Um, so they may have registered that, I don't know. But oftentimes, I, when I'm talking to people with a new product or a new company and they have a slogan, I say, well, is this going to, are you married to it? Is it going to be in use for a good long time? If so, then registration may be appropriate. If it's not, then, you know, why, why waste the time and the money filing a registration when you're just going to stop using it after a few years when it's outlived its usefulness? But while you're using it, you're still gaining rights, right? So just, that's just a key point to remember. So to your point, use in commerce. 
Use in commerce is use that may be regulated by Congress, which is almost everything, right? It's pretty much anything you do, but it has to be interstate, and that's squishy, but it has to be interstate or between the U.S. and a foreign territory, all right? So if you are just the local pizza joint and your customer, well, I shouldn't even say that because restaurants are sort of a unique case and hotels and things like that because of previous decisions to do with civil rights and things like that, it's sort of presumed that restaurants and customers serve people from out of state. People are driving through, they stop there, and so Congress can regulate that. But if for whatever reason you have an exclusively local business that does no business with anybody outside of the state, then it's possible, uh, although Congress loves to regulate everything, it's possible they may, they may not be able to regulate your, what you're doing, in which case that's not use in commerce. Um, I, I've never run into that, but just, so typically you're not going to worry about this, but just this is the standard, all right? If you're selling a product online, chances are you're, you're good. Um, so, but that's, that's generally the standard. But it does have to be used as a trademark, okay? Again, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, the, the trademark has to be displayed in connection with the product or the service. Now, that depends on the product or the service, how that's going to happen. It could be on the product. Um, sometimes you're selling, um, you know, uh, minerals. It's not going to be on the product. It may be, uh, it may not even be on the big barrel that they come in or whatever minerals come in. I don't know. Um, it may be a bill of lading or an invoice or something like that. But there's always got to be some connection, again, because you want to make that connection in the mind of the consumer between the, the, the mark and the product or the service. So that's what I was getting at. So on the product or the packaging, if it's for sale online, whether it's a physical product or a software, downloadable software, it has to be displayed near the product. If you're selling it online, yet you also have to be able to show that someone can actually buy it. It can't just be an image of the product. There has to be an ability to use it in commerce, meaning there's a transaction that's going to happen. It's not, these are very low bars to reach, by the way. It's not hard to do. For services, um, it's a little trickier because you don't, display the mark on the service, you're displaying it in connection with the service. So, um, you know, the website, if the website has the trademark on it and you describe what services you provide and there's a way to contact you to, to purchase the services, great. If it's a retail store, the sign over the store, great. Invoices can work, again, if you have to get down to that. Uh, again, anything that shows that connection. Um, but for most people, like for example, to, to get into the, the realm of trademark applications, screen, web, screenshots of websites are the majority of what we submit when we have to show that we're using something. Whether it's a, a, you know, an online retail for a particular product or if it's a screenshot of the website describing the services, whatever it may be. That's usually what we're doing, but it doesn't have to be that. Uh, for software people, a beta is, can be use as long as it's available to your customers, not just internally. Like you, your own use for yourself uh, internally uh, doesn't qualify. But if you're allowing your customers to test it out, whether it's a beta, a, a, you know, a free trial, great, that's, that qualifies. Even free software, you don't have to have, money does not have to change hands. Free software is great. Free services are great. Infra, uh, you, can, you, can get a, you, you can have trademark rights for a, web, a blog that's just informational. You're just presenting information about a particular topic. Okay? Money does not have to change hands. What is not use? What's well, commonly called token use. So this is use that you're that you are trying to make just so you can say you've made use. It's not, you don't, you're not really ready yet, but you're like, well, you know, hey, Joe, just can you buy this for me so I have something? Can I just ship this to you across state lines so I can say I did it? That won't work. If, if it's found out that that's what you've done, that won't work. Um, and I mean, most people aren't gonna do that, but it, you know, just keep in mind that it has to be a real transaction or a re if you're selling something, it has to be a real transaction. Ornamental use. Uh, this comes up a lot. Everybody loves to start t-shirt companies because they're easy to do and people love t-shirts. And they like to put slogans on the front of their shirts. A slogan on the front of the shirt typically does not function as a trademark because it's not telling someone who produced the shirt or sold the shirt. It's just a, a cool phrase on the front of a shirt, right? Um, 
so typically that's not going to function as a trademark. Um, it's not always the case, but that's generally, you know, there's a weird, the weird variation on that is if you put a, a, a word or a phrase or a, a, or a logo or something up here on the breast pocket area, all of a sudden now that's generally speaking trademark use because that's usually where you see it, like on your vest there and on a lot of people's shirts, that's where the mark typically appears. So that's a little different. Uh, ornamental can also just be a design element on a product that has nothing to do with source. It's just, you know, stripes on something that just looks good and, and you're not going to claim that you're the only one that can, that can use that, that it's indicating source. Um, and then non-trademark use, which is j just, you know, again, use not in context with products or services. It's just sort of, it, you know, if it's a, a word or a phrase, it's just sort of in the middle of some text. It's, it doesn't stand out at all. You're, you're, you're just using it sort of descriptively. So um, those are all things that are not trademark use. So you want to make sure you don't fall into any of these categories, and typically you won't. I mean, it's um, particularly for, for sort of your core brands, it's going to be pretty obvious that you're using, using it as a trademark. Where you run into some of this stuff is when it's like a slogan or if it's a, like a sub brand or some technology, like the name of a technology that you're using. That can, sometimes that people run into problems with those because of the way that they describe it on, the, like on their marketing material. They'll, make it, they'll use it just sort of as a noun rather than as a, as a trademark. Um, so one of the things that we often do is we review marketing materials and websites just to make sure that people are using these things as a trademark and using it properly. <clears throat> so when we're talking about the trademark rights you gain through use, we're talking about what are called common law trademark rights. So again, common law trademark rights established by, through, by, or through, whatever, continuous, consistent use, use, and federal registration is not required. So what do you get? So I've been using the trademark for a year. I, haven't, I don't have a registration. Well, all right, well, what do I have? Well, you've got trademark rights that you can use to enforce your mark against infringers. You could sue someone for infringement. And you can use the little superscript TM or SM if you've got a service, either one, uh, after your mark. You can't use the R in a circle until you have a registered trademark. That's what that stands for. Yeah? There are state, tra yes, there are state trademark registrations. Um, we don't do them often. We would typically do a state registration when federal registration is not available to us. A state registration is limited to within the borders of the state, but it, it can have some value, and they're exceedingly cheap. I mean, you, you might, you, there's no harm in doing it, um, but we don't often do it. Um, so you've got a lot of rights. And depending on how long you've been doing it, those rights may be really, really strong. But the downside of, is that your, the scope of your rights is limited to the geographic area in which the mark is used, where your customers are located. In other words, where do people recognize your trademark as a trademark? I mean, if you're here in, in New Hampshire and, you're, and your market is New England, you haven't you know, nev never had a contact, a customer, or anything in California, you may not have enforceable trademark rights in California because you're just here, okay? Um, on the, on, when you're online, this may not be as big an issue because potentially you've got customers all over the place, you've got gl global reach. Um, but if it's tested, if there's a dispute and this is tested, this is what they're going to be looking at is, well, how far do your rights really extend here? What, are, you, are you expanding um, or are you just a local pizza shop you know, if you're a local pizza shop in, in Durham, you're probably not going to be able to make any noise about someone with a local pizza shop in Cleveland. Because the, the fundamental question is, will a consumer think that there's some, be confused and think there's some relationship there? <laughs> unlikely, I would think. Unless there's, I mean, it's certainly possible, but it's unlikely. Is, is using the TM uh, help you enforce the... Yeah, it doesn't have any particular legal effect, but it does put people on notice, right? And so, and that can be an important element when you're talking about this. You can say, well, if someone says, well, I didn't know that was a trademark. So, well, we made it pretty clear that we were using this as a trademark. It's not that it has any, again, any specific legal effect. If you leave it off, it doesn't necessarily hurt you. And in fact, what I often tell people is, if you've got a big, you've got a website or a marketing piece or whatever, and a big block of text, and you mention your trademark a lot, you don't have to put the TM after it every single time because it can look 
bad. It just looks bad. Put it where it's being used most significantly, up at the top or whatever it is, and then don't worry about it from then on. I see people sometimes wanting to use it in contracts. You don't have to use it in contracts. It's fine. Um, but use it. I mean, it's, uh, you've, if you've got the rights, you might as well put that TM there. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt. The, the other question then is, apart from you talking about local, yeah. uh, you know, local uh, markets and things, how about internationally? Like, we're all dealing internationally. But sure. Can you talk about that or is there a, a sure. other things later on? No, I, I can, I, we can talk about Well, well let's, let's table that, and, and when we get to the end, let's talk about international trademarks, because can, we can certainly touch on that a bit. Um, so if, you want to get to the, if, you, if you're interested in federal registration, and as I say, it's, a, it's certainly a good idea, here are the benefits, some of the benefits of federal trademark registration. The, the, the most important one is that it, when you get that registration, it broadens the scope of what we call your priority nationwide. Now, we say priority and not rights because it, it, when we're talking about trademark rights, we're talking about who used first, right? And that's the concept of priority. And so if you're here in, in New England doing your thing and you get a federal registration, you may not have actually used yet in California, but now you've got this registration. You have priority over anyone else who might come later. Okay, so that's the concept of it. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're, you're, you know, you've used it everywhere, but you have this priority. Um, and the priority date, the date of priority is the date of, of your filing date of the application, which is important, but we'll talk about that. Um, it's, it's prima facie evidence of your exclusive right to use that trademark, that's the subject of that registration, for the products and services listed in that registration. It can be used as a basis for gaining registration in foreign countries. Um, as was touched on over there, you can register your trademark with, the, uh, with U.S. Customs and Border Control, uh, and they will, in theory, um, use that as things are getting imported. And if they, if they think there's an issue, they, you can hold up infringing products um, at the border. You can now use the R in a circle symbol, which everybody loves. Um, and there's a, in Word, it's a symbol that you can actually select and type in. You don't have to, it's really uh, easy to do. And just in general, it may add value to your company, right? If, if you're looking to be acquired, you're seeking funding, people who are coming to talk to you about your company, they may like that assurance that you've locked this down. There, there, there's, there's less of a chance that there's going to be a problem down the line because you've gone through this process of, theoretically anyway, you've done your due diligence, you've done your searching, you, you know what's out there, you, you've secured your registration. That may be helpful when you're having these discussions. But if somebody, talking about priority, if Joe Smith has been running a business for 50 years right. in Oregon, mm -hmm. you still can. Yes, exactly. So, so when we're talking about this, so what this doesn't do, and, and here, we'll do a little, oh, God, now I have to draw the map of the United States. It sort of looks like this, right? Perfect. So if we're here, and there's someone out here who's, who's been in business for 50 years, let's say, they never got a registration. We come along, and we do our thing, and then all of a sudden, we get our registration. Well... You know, we now have priority, except for this guy. He was there before us. He has priority over us. So what we can't do is, you know, knock him off the map, right? We can't wipe him away. But what we may be able to do is prevent him from expanding, depending on things, right? So that's sort of the goal. So there may often be these little pockets where you're like, I'm, I'm sort of stuck there. But maybe you enter into a deal with them or deal with that company or whatever it may be. You cobalt, cobalt. just above the border in Canada. Oh, well, then it's not a problem. Uh, potentially not a problem, yeah. I mean, he may still say he's got, if he's just over the border and he's been actually, you know, got customers in the U.S., yeah. then maybe he does have some rights okay. wherever that may be. Um, but if he's just exclusively Canada, then I'm not, yeah. not going to worry about him. That was the extent of my artistic skills. So we'll dig into a little bit of the trademark application process because it, there's some elements of it that I think are important to understand. So there are two what are called bases for application. One is use and one is intent to use. 
Use is what it sounds like. You're filing the application, and at the date you file the application, you say, I'm using the trademark, and here's evidence of my use. It's a screenshot of the website. It's an image of the tag on the, the shirt, whatever it may be. And you're saying it's, it's been in use in commerce for all of these goods and services in the app that I'm listed in the application as of the date of the application. That's the easy one. What's more common is this intent to use basis. This is what you do when you you have your business plan, you know what you want to do, you've decided on a trademark, you know what products and services you're going to sell, but you're not ready to sell yet. It may be you're still in research and development mode, you know, you're still working with manufacturers trying to figure out how this thing's going to work, uh, so maybe you're a few years down the line before you're going to sell anything. You can still file an application. And what's important is that is this filing date because that's the when you ultimately get your registration your priority dates from that filing date so if we filed today and two three years later you finally get your registration well your priority date is today all right um, this is companies do this all the time because you, you don't want to wait until the product hits the shelf to file your application you want to file it sooner rather than later because again in the US earlier is is key but the key understanding is that when you file that application, you have to have this bona fide intent to use the trademark on all of the goods and services in your application. So you can't just throw in, you know, everything, airplanes and cars and hamburgers and all that stuff just because you want to. It has to be things that you actually have a real intent to, to, to sell at some point. Um, and that may come up in a dispute. You may have to, to show evidence of that intent, which could be your business plan. It could be all sorts of things. Yeah. Aren't there a lot of examples of companies that apply for registrations but don't end up using it? Yeah, absolutely. So, right, if you apply, so the way it works is if you file this on an intent to use basis, at some point the, the trademark office will say, application is great, we love it, the only thing you have to do now is show us that you're using the trademark. Just give us evidence of your use. If you're not ready, you can get this six month extension of time and you can get five of those six month extension times. You can really draw it out a long time. Um, and we've had clients who go that whole length of time. You know, it's like three and a half years or so. And at the end they go, I just never sold the product. So you never do it and then the application just dies. It's just abandoned at that point. Um, so that, that does happen. So that's a short period of time, three years, relatively speaking. I've, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've read articles uh, particularly uh, talking about uh, models, uh, the name of a model for a vehicle. Mm -hmm. they, they apply for registration, they don't end up using it, and they just kind of keep it on the back shelf, and they've actually sued in cases where other companies years later have, have attempted to use that name. Well, if they, even if they, if they didn't get a registration and they still used it in some way, um, they would still potentially have enforceable rights. But if all you ever do is, a, is apply, is file an application, and you never make any use, you've got an application. And then if that application dies, you've got nothing. So I'm not sure this specific example you're talking about, but you know what, what that sort of calls to mind is there are lots of brands that you would think aren't really active right now, but these companies sort of do just enough to keep them barely alive, like they sell t-shirts with the brand on it somehow. And that's all they do, but it's enough to keep the brand alive, even if it's not for the main product, maybe it was a car, right? Mm. Yeah, Pan Am's a good example, right? But Pan Am's interesting because that trademark has changed hands, and there's a company here in New Hampshire that owns Pan Am now and uses it for train transportation. And but they also license it out and they sell bags and things. Um, so it's not used for air airlines anymore. But there are some that, that you wouldn't even know they still exist, but they're just barely there. There's been some pushback on that. Um, situations where they've tried to enforce it based on some t-shirt that they're selling some deep on their website somewhere and courts have said that's just not enough. Um, but people do try to keep these things alive as long as they can because there is that residual value, right? That goodwill, people have some association with it even if it's just nostalgia, right? Um, that has some value. And then there are people, there are companies that buy up all these old dead brands and they start cranking out new products it's not the same old company, but that people still have that connection to the brand, so they might think, oh, it's going to be just as good as it was 50 years ago when I was buying it. So that does happen. Um, so intent to use applications, uh, I mean, two, three years, I, when, I, when I'm talking to someone, that's what I ask them. I said, if, are you going to 
are we, are we talking about something you can actually produce and sell within three years or so? If so, then great. If it's going to be longer than that, maybe we wait a little bit. Um, but that's, that's how that works. Um, And I can back up and talk a little bit more about the tra about trademark registration, but I want to make sure to get to some of these practical advice, practical tips. Um, searching. Do some searching. You can do this on your own. Um, before you start using your trademark, maybe you're at the early stages trying to decide what it's going to be. Come up with your big list of 10 names, whatever you come up with. Do some searching. Chances are you're going to find one or two right off the bat that are a problem, and you can sort of whittle that down. But what you're, what's important to understand is what you're looking for is not just an exact match for the exact same products or services. While that is a problem, that's not the only problem. Um, you want to look for anything that is similar, any trademark that is similar in sort of the overall commercial impression. So if it sounds the same, looks the same, um, then and and it's being used for the same or related products or services, so it doesn't have to be the exact same thing, then it's a potential problem. Again, the, the question to ask is, would someone be confused? Would a consumer think, well, these must be related in some way. I, you know, they, they seem so similar to me. Um, if I'm going into a store and I, like Rawlings, when I say Rawlings, I know it's spelled R-A-W-L-I-N-G-S, but maybe it sounds like it's spelled R-A-H-L-I-N-G-S. And so if someone were to try to use that, even though it's spelled differently, it's still a potential problem because a consumer would think it's the same thing. So you can do a lot of this yourself before you come to someone like me and finish that off. And then, then we dig deeper and broader and try to get a really good picture of what's out there. But by all means, do as much as you can. You can search at the trademark office. Um, it's relatively easy to use, um, and I encourage you to do it just because it's interesting to see what's out there. But um, uh, definitely do some searching before you go and spend the time and the money to start rolling out some new brand, and you don't because you don't want to get a cease and desist letter a month later, or s worse yet, a year later, when you've already spent all that time and money, and people now know you, and now you got to change the mark. Uh, after you do get your mark, police do, do your policing, right? See who else is out there. You're looking for the next one to come along that could be a problem for you. Um, it used to be you'd use, what, Google Alerts? I don't think anybody does that anymore. But whatever you do these days, uh, we, there are services that we use that, that monitor for activity at trademark offices and things like that. Um, but just keep an eye out, particularly in your industry. I mean, see what's going on. Uh, and if there's a, a problem, then talk to your trademark attorney or whoever and, and see if there's anything you need to do about it. Uh, do you, do yeah. you use tests for searching? Yes, well, I think it's now, t yes, it's TESS or TM search or whatever they're calling it now. USPTO. Yeah, the USPTO. Yeah, they have their, their, own, uh, uh, their own search uh, 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 for their database. Yep. Uh, keep really good records. This is what I'm talking about when, when talking about sort of this, this intent to use thing. You want to have a good um, history of your development of your brand and your product and your service, but in connection with that, your brand. Um, because it, you never know when it may become useful in a dispute down the line at some point. Keep track of these dates of use because those are, again, the dates of first use are the important dates. Um, know when you started using it. Know when your first um, sale was. Um, if, you're gonna, if you make any tweaks or changes to the trademark, keep track of all of that. So just keep, keep good records of things. Um, which typically most businesses will, but it's, it's just good to, to reiterate that. Use your trademark consistently. Once you've decided how it's going to look, it's got to look that way. All right? Um, and that, it's as simple as that space. If, you, if, you, if you're using happy land as one word, and then all of a sudden you start using it as two words, that could be a problem because that could be treated as different enough to allow someone else to come in and, and, and sort of start creeping into your territory. So be consistent. Make sure that you use it in a way. The reason I put those in all caps, that sort of trademark lawyer brain thing that we do, because you want to make sure that people are re recognizing that I'm using that as a trademark. All caps means I'm using it as a trademark and not just as another word in this sentence, right? Um, better yet, where you can, if you're selling baseball gloves, it's Rawlings brand baseball gloves, right? Rawlings brand baseball gloves. So that sort of thing. I mean, it's awkward. 
Um, you don't have to use it all the time, but that sort of a, gets to that question. You want to avoid people just suddenly saying, you know, it's a, it's an asp- it's an aspirin, you know, or a band aid. Band aid has been band aid a long time ago. Their 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 jingle was I'm stuck on band aid because band aid stuck on me. Then they changed it to I'm stuck on band aid brand because band aid stuck on me because everybody was calling every adhesive bandage a band aid and they didn't want it to become generic. So. These are things that, and again, we review this sort of marketing material to make sure that, that you're using it properly and consistently. Um, we, you can talk to your, if you've got a marketing department, whoever it is, someone who answers the phone, someone who answers your emails, make sure they know what they need to say, what they need to write, because you want it to be consistent when you're communicating to the public. Um, you can have a brand manual if, you're, if your company's big enough to require one. You can have a whole manual that talks about how we use it, what we say, what we do. Um, really important stuff. You're not saying that, that the slogan that might not be marked strengthens the, the trademark, is it? it can, yeah, I mean, it can. Like, so if you've got your mark and then the slogan underneath it and you use them together a lot of times, um, yeah, it just all of that all together sort of helps reinforce the, that this is being used as a, as a trademark, sure. Yeah. yeah what, uh, It, sure. If yeah, absolutely. It depends on the on what the variation would be. Um, I mean, the only reason to do that is if a you've got the resources to just sort of cover your bases, uh, but because the understanding is that you wouldn't be able to get a registration unless you use that variation, right? Mm-hmm. So if you if you applied for both Happy Land as one word and Happy Land as two words, that's fine, but you're ultimately going to have to decide how to use it. And so one of those may be inapplicable down the line. Um, there would be a variation in market, but if you extended a market outside where you started? Yeah, possibly. Okay. Sure, yeah. Do you have to apply for that? You, not necessarily. I mean, I, I, it's not something that I've encountered all that often. Um, but you, what, you could, what you can do is consider uh, the multiple applications for the different ways you might use Happy Land. Let's say... It, it, when we tip, typically, when we file an application, we'll, we'll file it for just that word in black and white with no respect for color, typeface, anything like that, which means the registration would apply to any variation, any color typeface you might use. But I might also apply for the specific typeface and color that I use. I might all, if I have a logo, I might apply for the combination of the logo and the word because I use that in that way consistently just to cover all my bases. Again, that depends on how much money you want to throw at this thing. Um, Mm. Yeah. Mickey Mouse is so IP protected. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, but that brings up a good point, which is when you're talking about uh, logos, the, the logo that's, that is in your registration, that's what's protected. If you change your logo in any material way, even if it's sort of the same, if it's different enough, your registration no longer covers it. So when people come to me with logos, I s- same question, how long are you going to use this? Is this thing going to change at all? Because people, when they first get started, they like their logo, and then they're like, I'm tired of this thing, and I'm going to change it. And then all of a sudden, this registration or this application is no longer applicable. But with cartoon characters and things, they're, they're, they're often different ways that they may appear on a tag or on a whatever, different stances, whatever Mickey does. Um, you could the- theoretically file applications for each of those versions that you're going to use as a, as a trademark down the line. And I think that's close to the end. Oh, yeah, disputes. So, sure, we'll touch on disputes. I don't know how much time I have. A um, uh, little bit of time. Yeah. Um, so, typically, your typical trademark dispute, you get a cease and desist in the mail. It's because they're saying, hey, you're using trademarks that's similar to ours for products and services that's similar to ours, and we were using it first. Here's look, the registrations that we own. Here's how long we've been using it, how great we are, people are going to be confused, etc. And here's what we want you to do. First, you need to stop using the trademark. I want to know how much money you've made selling these products. Um, if you've got applications, registrations, whatever, you need to get rid of those. Domain names, Twitter handles, all that stuff. That's sort of the heavy duty cease and desist that you might get or that you might send. Well, the question 
as is just it, it, generally speaking, the questions will be, well, is it really the case that there's a likelihood of confusion here? Are people really going to be confused by these marks? Are the goods and services really related? Do, does the person who sent the letter actually, does that company actually have priority? That's really the biggest question. If you're sending the demand, do you really care about use or do you just care that you don't want them to register the mark? Because it, they may be the same marks, they're different, the services are different enough that it may not be really a big problem, but you don't like having that other trademark on the, on the, the register at the trademark office. Is there a way you can coexist? We do a lot of coexistence agreements. Um, because the trademarks may be the same or similar, but the products, there's enough of a distinction there where we're going, yeah, okay, we can live with that, but you need to stay in your lane, right? Um, we do a lot of work for Under Armour, and for whatever reason, people love to file trademark applications that include armor in the name, and Under Armour is really protective of armor in all its forms, as you might imagine. But oftentimes, it may be that the, the mark that's being applied for is a little different, and the products are really specific to some, some field of use, whatever it may be. A lot, the, other, the other, for whatever reason, is that a lot of them are, are to do with Christian-based products, because the armor of God is something. I don't know a lot about it. But, so the agreements may be, that's fine. You can use it for Christian-based products, but that's it. After that, it would be a problem. So that may be what the coexistence agreement might say. So we, that happens a lot. Um, but the biggest question is this issue of priority. That's why you keep good records. You want to know when was your first date of first use. Because what you don't want to do, and you want to do some investigation too, because what you don't want to do is send a demand letter to someone saying, hey, we have priority, and they turn it around and say, actually, no, we've been using it for 100 years. And so you're the one who's infringing now. So you've got to know what you're doing before you send out these, these letters. Um, hopefully, you'll never have to deal with this. Um, I have had plenty of situations where someone's been out there in the market for a year, and then they get the demand letter, and it's, it actually is a problem, and we gotta change the name. And after a year, they've spent a lot of time and money on this thing, and it's gonna take time and money to rebrand and to train the customers with this new name. Usually we can get some time. It's not an overnight thing. Maybe you'll get six months or so to make the change. If you're lucky, maybe they'll even help offset some of the costs. Doesn't, use, doesn't often happen, but it does happen. Uh, but you just don't want to be in that position. So that's why understanding what's out there before you start using it, before you file applications, is so important. Uh, by the way, I mean, like a, trade, a, a search, if we were to do a trademark search, it's $300. It's, that's relatively inexpensive in the grand scheme of things. Um, so I, I, I think that's good insurance, frankly, to have a sense of what's going on out there before you go and, and, and move forward. Um, and, that, and like I said, you can do a lot of searching on your own as well. Um, that's the end of that, but if we've got some time, I'd be happy to talk a little bit briefly about, um, more about the trademark registration process and all that, but also if you want to touch on international, we do a lot of international work. Um, so we work with foreign firms. If our client wants to file an application in Canada or Europe or Japan or whatever, we communicate with the trademark office, the trademark firms there who handle the, the application process. In most of those countries, Registration, rights are based on registration. So it's not who uses first, it's who registers first. As you might imagine, that can cause problems because someone doesn't have to actually show that they're using something to get a registration and to be a problem for you. In China in particular, if you're manufacturing anything in China, get a registration in China because if you don't, your manufacturer probably will uh, because they're gonna love to do a run of your products and then do a little midnight run for themselves. You know? uh, and if they get a registration for your trademark, and then you start trying to ship stuff out of China, guess what? Your products get held up at the border because they think you're the infringer now. So if you're doing anything in China or wherever you manufacture, get registrations there. Um, it's, there's no worldwide international registration per se. There's not one that covers the whole world. You have to do it in these individual territories. You can cover all of the European Union, which is 28 countries, I think, in one registration. Um, but for the most part, you just got to pick off those countries where you're doing business or you're manufacturing. Um, and nobody can do them all. Uh, it's just too expensive. Some countries are less expensive. Some are more expensive. China and Japan end up being expensive. But yeah. Is, is the European registration is the Madrid No, but Madrid is important. But the uh, European registration is called the Community Trademark. Um, Madrid Protocol is a way uh, of... Um, 
If you file an application in the U.S., you can extend that application to these other, to many to, to other countries that are that are signatories to this this uh, agreement. Um, it's a less expensive way of of securing registration in foreign territories. We don't use it a lot because, not to get too deep into the weeds on this, but those foreign registrations are tied to your U.S. application. So if your U.S. application dies or has a problem it can really screw up all of those foreign ones. So we typically try to file directly in those foreign territories instead of using Madrid. Are, are there trademark squatters? Sure, yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you'll see it come up. I mean, the, I think I, I, Apple's had numerous issues with things like iPad or iPhone. People just register them in wherever, in China or wherever it may be, just to sit on them. Um, maybe they're actually using it, maybe they aren't, but they're sitting on it. And, and, Apple, has and Apple has to do something. Yeah, they ought to do something. So that's why it's, like I said, it's key. You don't have to do it everywhere, but just where it's important to your business, think about it. Um, any questions? I think we've got time for some questions. I, have a, I want to make a comment. Yeah. Uh, just an interesting comment. Um, <clears throat> when I was in the Philippines, Philippines and all this there, uh, I was in a mall and uh, I saw a place called Whataburger. And all they did was get the uh, golden arches and turn them upside down. <laughs> Uh -huh. What a burger. Yep. So what, what, could, what, what could McDonald's do? Uh, what would be their uh, options? Well, presumably the McDonald's has a presence in the Philippines. I mean, they're everywhere. So if they do, I would assume they have enforceable trademark rights there. So the fact that if, if it is, in fact, the Golden Arches turned upside down, um, I would assume they could do something about that. I mean, the, the other thing that came up was a year or two ago, they were in entire Apple stores in China that were not actual Apple stores. But, I mean, they looked exactly like Apple stores. They were selling products, but they were not Apple stores. So it goes beyond that. I mean, it's amazing. And um, so, yeah, it's a real issue. Um, when we do, obviously, Under Armour deals with counterfeits a lot, as do all the, the apparel manufacturers, it's to the point... They're, the counterfeiters are so good that some companies will, they, they, you know, they get these counterfeit products. Sometimes they'll say, well, that's actually pretty good. You know, we might actually try to t use some of this counterfeit technology and, you know, figure out how they've done this. But it's to the point where some of these, sh I remember reading an article a few years ago where the counterfeit footwear, the only way that people could tell the difference was by the smell, the scent of the glue that was used. Otherwise, they were entirely the same shoe. And at some point, these, the companies just say, oh, we can't, you can't do anything about it. It's just too much to try to stop every single one of them. Um, but that's, I mean, the counterfeiting is a whole different, a whole different realm. Um, but, uh, um, but at the very least, if you've got your, your brand, your trademark locked down in these territories, you've got some, some uh, uh, avenue for enforcement. So, yeah. Is there any advantage to a state trademark? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it gives you something, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, better than, it's better than nothing. As I said earlier, we, we do state registrations from time to time. Um, typically, where if it's just a if it's purely an intrastate business, um, or if we just can't get a federal registration for some reason, at least we'll get that state registration uh, just to have something in our pocket if there is the need to to enforce. Um, we, do, we do a, a little series of workshops. We do a lot of work with potters, hmm. and, and the real question is the design of the issues get to, get to be a question, and nobody's going out and filing a design patent. Right. So right. They, Right. But so the real question is, there may be some advantages for them to get a trademark on their product so that they can at least identify themselves as being different. If they can, yeah. It's a good question. I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure about state registrations for non-traditional marks. I, I don't know. I mean, these state, they're just not equipped, I think. They don't really examine them. Um, so I'm not sure how that would work for that kind of protection. Um, but keep in mind, if there is something protectable there, uh, and, they're, and it's been used consistently, then they've got some rights that they can enforce even without a federal or state registration. I mean, it just depends on the scope of those rights. So it may not even be necessary to have that. Um, so, but yes, yeah, state registration, it's usually inexpensive. I think it's, you know, $100, $50. I think it's $50. Yeah, $50. Um, so, but like I said, it's not like they, they don't really do a search. They don't really do, I mean, they, I think they do a basic search of their database to see if there's anything there, but... I don't even know if they do that. UNHS1. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, it's not like the trademark office. It's very, very basic. Um, any other questions? Yeah. You talked a little bit ago about the 
search and yeah. some costs associated with that. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the application process and, 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 you know, and potential costs. Yeah. Also, um, and give you an opportunity as well to contrast services that your firms and firms like it offer compared to other services like the legal zoom legal table. zoom yep sure yeah i actually had was had that question on the phone yesterday and it comes up more and more and it's not just legal zoom there are so many of these where you can go online and you just fill out a form and you give them your credit card number and they file the application right there um but to answer your first question first so the trademark application process um, uh, what we do is we obviously need to understand what the product or service is. We need to try to get as in-depth an understanding of that as we can because we want the application to cover as accurately as we can the, the, the scope of those products and services. Um, we don't, you, you want the application to include services, if we're talking about services, you want that description of the services to be as broad as possible so that you're grabbing as much land as you can in that application while still being accurate and without being so granular and detailed that all you're claiming is this teeny tiny little slice of something and then people can sort of nibble in around the edges when they, if they come along with something else. Um, so that's a big part of what we do is figuring out, all right, well, how are we going to describe what it is that you do? Because you have a way of describing it if you're in your elevator pitch, right? But that may be different and it will be different than the way we describe it when we're talking about it in terms of a trademark application. Um, once the application is filed, it takes three months or so for the trademark office to look at it before they even open it up and look at it. What they're going to do is they're going to look primarily at their database. They want to see if there's any applications or registrations for similar marks for re arguably related services. If there aren't, the application just moves on down the line. If there is, they will issue what's called an office action. Um, they can issue office actions for other reasons, too. If they don't like the way we've described your service, if there's some wor language that they want changed, that's you know, easy stuff to deal with. Or if they think the mark is descriptive, which on that spectrum of things, if they think that, that it's, just, it's just merely descriptive, it doesn't function as a trademark, um, or it's a, it, you know, not, not so much so that it would pass through, um, they, then you have the opportunity to make arguments against that, against whatever the, the trademark office has said. Um, after the, and, and this is where, frankly, the rubber meets the road in terms of some of these legal zooms and things like that. I don't know exactly how they deal with those situations where if there's a problem with the application, where they step in or if they just leave you on your own. I, I just don't know what they do. I don't think they do a whole lot. Um, so um, if it gets beyond that, there's this 30-day window in which it's published for opposition, meaning there's a 30-day window in which anyone who thinks they might be harmed by the registration of the mark can oppose that application. We do it all the time. We're on both sides of that all the time. Um, if it makes it through that 30-day window and it's a use-based application, you've already shown that you're using it, it just moves on and gets registered. If it's uh, intent to use, then the clock starts ticking on you to start using it and show them that you're using it. So that's how that works. Um, so I think the, the oh, cost-wise, um, I typically tell people if, if it's a, as was mentioned over there, the trademark office breaks products and services out into classes, and um, they charge a fee for each class included in the application. You don't have to include everything you do in the application, but you're, let's, you, you want to include your core products and services at a minimum. So let's assume it's a single class application uh, and there's no problems and it's use based. From beginning to end, it usually ends up costing between our fees and, and government fees around $1,300. Um, you know, that goes up depending on the number of classes you've got. It goes up if it's an intent to use application and you need time to show use. And it will definitely go up if there's a problem with the application at some point, if there's a, a refusal or some, some kind. So the value of a firm like ours, I think, is that we're not just having you fill out a form and give you your credit card number and we go bloop and the application gets filed. We'll actually make sure that, that the application is as, uh, as strong as it can possibly be and has the best chance of success as it can possibly have. And if there's an issue, we'll deal with that issue. We don't just leave you on your own. Sometimes these legal zooms and whatever else is out there can be perfectly fine. I mean, we see plenty of registrations and that's what people use because it, it works. But it's those times when there's a more complicated service at issue or there's a potential problem that firms like ours, um, that's where we come into play and that's the value. And so what we, we're managing the thing from beginning to end. We have it in our system and you know, we communicate with you at every step of the way. And um, so that's what we do, yeah. Sir, one last question. Yeah. It's good as long as you continue using the trademark. Uh, it, 
you have to renew. So the registration, um, there's a renewal at t every 10 years. And there's, there's also, between the fifth and sixth year, you have to show that you're still using it. Um, but after that time, it's just every 10 years you renew it. So as long as you're still using it, it's, it lasts and lasts. It's not a limited time like a patent. Um, it just goes on and on. So, yeah. And that can be transferred. For, that be part, if, you, if a company's bought or something. Absolutely. Yep, they're that. just assets of the company. Absolutely. It, the, both the, the mark, the goodwill, all of that value is all part of that uh, trans, uh, that that uh, acquisition. Any of the registrations, it's all part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And you can license license trademarks out. Obviously, I mean, when you know the Game of Thrones book, HBO doesn't have a division that makes pop-up books. I don't think they probably licensed that to some company to to make that. Um, that's. I mean, that's uh, trademarks are licensed all the time. That all that stuff is licensed. I mean, nobody's. I mean, there, there are companies that just make licensed products. That's what they do. So, Just a question related, I guess, what you guys were talking about earlier. I, I wasn't sure. I can see how UNH is going to try and have licensing for patents and that sort of stuff. But it, does UNH uh, have trademark? Yeah, actually. So how do you get used for that? If Listening to that, how would UNH trademark something that they then want to obviously license to others? So, there are really two categories that are usually like that are institutionalized in the athletic part. So the Wildcat probably went ahead of the body. UNH, University of Future, Law School Marks. We license those to collegiate licensing companies, which is, then goes and sub licenses all of our marks to uh, vendors right. who create apparel for, for UNH for the stores downtown. Right. Um, and then on the other side, we have our, what we consider programmatic for our innovation. A research faculty. Yeah. yeah. So, for instance, Eric Eric Schwartz's um, training in football, helmet this training uh, and tackling, tackling and training uh, program. The goal there is um, we're going to license a package to um, somebody. It may be a helmet company. It may be NFL. It may be USA Football. It may be somebody um, who's interested in licensing that training. So that's a whole package, and not just the trademark, it's the other things. That it's more the cloudwork and the trademark. Right. But we have pieces of software that we have uh, that the interoperability lab created right. has developed. Um, and rather than chasing down a patent, software patent, to, as I, I think somebody mentioned in one of the previous sessions, the money that it, it just costs a ton of money, right. and it's really not worth it where we are right now with patent law to file uh, software patents. Right. Um, so we attach trademarks. And to some customers, it's important, to some it's not. Um, and so we, we balance the scale there. Who is it going to matter if we file a trademark application on this piece of software and not on this one? Right. So that, because uh, we work, we do a bit of work with the company on right with the uh, Center for Coastal Ocean Mapping. And so they've come through with a few ideas, and, uh, and uh, I think some of their concern is the control of their research, making sure it gets into and I think having that. That's actually the one state registration we have. Oh, it is? This, yeah. Which one is that? Center for Coastal. Oh, okay. Uh, right. yeah. Great. Thank you, man. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah.